So, are you curious? Argent enthusiast, Kyle Olson. And action! On today's episode, we'll be discussing the first time Mandy Fabian ever sat in the director's chair. We'll talk about the learning curve that comes from making your first short film, dealing with actors and crew who have way more experience than you. Plus, she tells me about the worst direction she ever gave an actor. But as today's chat starts, directing is the last thing she ever wanted to do. Chapter 6. The First Time I Was Ever Wrong. I guess we're we're now ready to talk about the big chair. The big D. Yeah. So <laughs> that sounds dirty. When did the first opportunity to direct something come up, or 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 did you conjure it up out of out of sheer force of will? <laughs> no, I never wanted to be a director. Okay. I really never like. I laughed heartily at that joke. You know, when people are like, but what I really want to do what is do direct. Is direct. Yeah. yeah. I thought that was hysterical. I think I, if I'm being honest, I think I probably like looked down on people who wanted to direct. I'm like, oh, that's such an ego thing. Unless you were born with that, I've got to be Quentin Tarantino. I was like, no, nope, right. it's all, the rest of it's just ego and you just want to be in charge. Um, and I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so then let's get into that then. And, so what is it that, that turned you? Yeah, and I think you can tell from this podcast, like, th that's actually the first time I was ever wrong about anything, right? <laughs> um, except for cell phones and bottled water and all the other things that I was like, who's going to spend money on that? <laughs> um, so who needs email on their phones? Dumb idea. Um, so, yeah, so I was totally a writer and an actor, and then I had written a short film that I gave to a producer friend of mine. Um, I was pregnant and it was a film that I really liked and I really wanted to do. And I, I, I mean, it was my first short. No, it was not the first short that I had written because I had written a short. I think I told you this. I can't remember called tour of pain. And I starred mm. in it and I wrote it and it was a walking tour of New York city of all the places where I had gotten dumped or disappointed oh. or rejected or shit on. Oh, and, wow. and it was just a funny, like it was a weird group of tourists who like couldn't get the good tour. So they came on mine. <laughs> um, it was a really cute short, but I, I yeah. didn't direct that, you know, I, I wrote it. Um, and so this was my, this was another, the second short film I think that I'd written and, she was like, I will produce this for you and we will provide all of the crew and, you know, we'll handle everything. Soup to nuts, uh, right down to designing the DVD cover for you and we will handle it. But you wow. have to direct. And I was like, oh, but I, I'm not a director. And yeah. she was like, that's the only way I'll do it. So I was like, huh, okay, okay. Yeah. And then she's like, you could still be in it. And I was like, no, I, <laughs> mm -mm, I don't want to do that. Like I, I didn't want to try to take on a, you know, directing a whole short film and then also be in it. I was like, you know. I was, yeah. I was, I wasn't even sure I was the best actor in town anyway, clearly. Cause I pretty much quit acting by this time. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, that, that was the first thing. But then of course I had also gone to film school and I just, that had been completely wiped from my mind, but that's where all of yeah. a sudden now I'm storyboarding because I'm like, what do you do? I'm like, well, I guess I have to figure out what I'm going to shoot. Like, do I have any ideas? And I, surprisingly I did. <laughs> and then as I remembered, oh, that's right. You, you make squares and then you write pictures in the squares of what you want things to look like. So you can remember, so you can keep track of everything. And as I was doing that, I was like, oh my God, I did this in college. Like I did this for movies that I, that I shot in college. And I, I even did this, not this extensively, but I did it for the music videos that I shot. Like mm -hmm. I wrote ideas down and, you know, I had lists of what I wanted to shoot and how I wanted it to cut together, but I never equated that with directing because I was always in everything. <laughs> yeah. So it, I just, you know, so, um, and also I'm a youngest child. I'm a follower. I, <laughs> yeah, oh, I don't yeah. need to be in uh, charge. Me too. I don't want people to look at me and go, you did this? Like, no, thank you. Um, so it was really 
I was very lucky that when she said, okay, you're on, I actually had a lot of skills that I'd already been exercising. And what she said to me, which is very sweet, which is why I'm going to share it with the world. (laughs) No, she said, you're, you're one of the funniest people I know. And this is your sense of humor. And if you hand this over to someone, you know, they may Mm. not, it'll be their sense of humor. And I, I agreed with her on that because when it comes to comedy, it's so subjective. Yes. And it has to be what you think is funny and what feels good to you. So I was like, and I had had an experience on an, my short film where, you know, it wasn't exactly what I wanted. It was close, but it wasn't exact. And I thought, well, my God, like th- this is worth it. Like at the end of the day, even if I hate it and I never want to direct anything ever again, at least I'll have one yes. project that I look and every joke was, was my take every, yeah. I, I did the best I could to get the results that I wanted and, and to have it be the story that I wanted to tell. And, and I was very lucky because I got Missy Pyle and I got Paul Witten and Patrick Fabian was the first of many cameos because he's had a cameo in every movie I've ever shot. Sometimes, usually on purpose, but there was one time when like an actor just didn't show up and I was like, babe, will you put on the wig? And he's like, yep. So <laughs> well, it's an easy me. call to make. Oh God. Yeah. Patrick Fabian of Better Call Saul fame stars in every one of my movies <laughs> in some way. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, like literally there were two movies where he wasn't even initially supposed to be in it, but then it happened. Like I was like, ah, I need to shoot more footage. I need a groom. You, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, but I look forward to actually writing something for him. Uh, oh, ah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I, that was it. And I, you know, I really, I was nervous, but like not that nervous because it was so much fun. Like I'd written a funny script and I had really funny actors and, they really guided me with like, okay, let's do a table read. Let's talk about it so that we can add more jokes or so we can kind of give people an idea of like backstory and relationship because that informs everything, right? Because when you're the director, you know, you, and you know about things like backstory, then you talk to the set designer and you go, let's Mm -hmm. get pictures of them together so that we can establish that they've been friends for a long time and have that. I want pictures of that on the dresser. And I need this dog is this man's life. So I need pictures of him with this dog plastered all over his apartment. You know, there were, it was just a really interesting process to me that it, you know, it was the start of something, but I had so much fun doing it because the details are what make comedy to me, is so delicious to me, you know? Right. So, so they, they are going to handle all the logistic stuff. Yeah. So you don't have to worry about that stuff. They found then, me a DP. They, oh, they, I was going to say, now, did you go about assembling your crew, but they actually like had say, Hey, here's people we've worked with in the past. It was a production company that produced like little reality show things or kind of YouTube things. Like they did a bunch of fun gamer stuff. Um, okay. They, they they had a whole thriving HD Films was the name of the company, and they had a whole thriving thing doing that stuff. So they worked together all the time. And she said, you know, I know t- I know everybody to do every job. We'll just have them do the short film. We're going to produce your narrative short film because why not that's fun right um so they i didn't interview people or anything they just handed me people and i was really lucky because they were all really good um and that was and 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 they had more experience yeah i mean you know because you're you're like that that's always the the joke about people to be a grip you have to have done so much experience you have to have been your master class and electrician and stuff too the only person who can walk onto a movie set with zero experience is the director well that is true and that was i mean again it was my job to be prepared it was my job to have the vision it was my job to be able to step in and talk to the actors which is still my favorite thing in the world about the job i I, I still want to get into that part of it yeah which that was really the the thing i only did really have skill in like i was ready for that and the other stuff i was so lucky because uh my the first dp i ever worked with was great he was like what about this and i was like great you know i i had (laughs) you know, three shots that I was like, I want this. I really want this. And he made it happen. Yeah. I mean, that's what I loved is I only had specific images maybe three times. And the rest of the time 
he was like, what about this? And what about that? And kind of explaining to me like, well, you can add this color to it to make it feel this way. And you could do, you know, we could do a moving shot like this. And I was like, yeah. So I didn't really come up with a lot of that. I had done a storyboard for this is how I, uh, this is how I'm going to make sure I get the pieces I need for the story, like for the edit Cause I had mm-hmm. done so much editing. Right. I kind of knew to cover myself in that way, but he made it look good, you know, and that was really helpful to me because I, I hadn't even, you know, I I just hadn't really considered that. I'd always just grabbed a, my cheap, you know, digital, what do they call that? High eight or whatever it was, the little eight eight Mm -hmm. mil, whatever it was, the, I don't remember what they're called now, the uh, mini DV. Yeah. You know, I mean, and we, we shot on that just like whatever point and shoot I'm going to dance and sing and then I'll edit it together so it was the first time I really took care with the visuals of it and tried to be cinematic about it so uh, for so for casting then um was it basically you just called your friends I did I mean I say I'm not that no judgment that's 100 percent. everything I've done has been the same way too I was like this is the type of person I know who can do this and so you call that person and say, hey, can you do this thing for me because you know that they can. Well, I also, and this is another thing that my producer was just great. Um, she encouraged me to reach out to people who had some sort of name because she thought that could help me sure. with festivals. And I'm positive yeah. that it did. I mean, okay. I will say all of my shorts that have someone of name value get into festivals. And the one that I did that I think is one of my be- best things didn't. Right. Like didn't get into the bigger festivals and sure. there's no one that doesn't have, they don't have a name. And <laughs> I think that's interesting. Right. So mm-hmm. she encouraged me. She's like, you have famous friends, you and your husband know a lot of people mm-hmm. and, or, you know, people who know people. So think about who would be right for this and call them up, you know? And so I, I did, but luckily Missy Pyle was like top of my list and she already knew Paul Witten who was going to be my lead actor, who I, I knew I wanted him because it, you know, we had sort of come up with it on set together, the idea for this. And he's so damn funny. And it was his house we were shooting in and, oh. and, and like, but he was just yeah. amazing, you know? So I needed to find someone to match with him and he knew Missy as well. So it was like a mutual friend. And then the fact that she was willing to do it, I think we, we ended up pushing production. We wanted to shoot it in probably like April and she wasn't available, but sure. she wasn't available till July. And of course I was, it was July 4th, I think. And I was pregnant and my baby was actually born on July 28th. So (laughs) I shot that movie, I think two weeks before my baby was born. Oh, wow. (laughs) And, uh, yeah, that's how we did it. So, uh, so at the start, you like, you obviously you've written the thing out. Like, do you have in your head how long it's going to be? Like, I mean, I, I know it's like one, one script page per minute or whatever too, but like, as you're planning it out, are you thinking like, oh, this is going to come in long. This is going to come in short. Like you, you have like approximately like this is going to be 12 minutes. I'm trying to remember. I do think that they probably timed the table read. We, we time okay. a table read. That's usually so you can get a sense of and, and script supervisors, if they're there, will do that. Right. Like, yeah. so a scripty will let you know, like your movie's coming in around this time and this these particular scenes. Um, so that you have a sense when you're on set, like just kind of, if you're in the zone or, right. you know, um, how much footage you're shooting for this much of a, <laughs> yes, yeah. sometimes so that that saying, then, then taking that and then trans and then figuring out wh- how long of a shoot it's going to be to get that. Um, yes that, and that no amount of time. Yes and no, because the way that I did it, 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 we never did a, how long of a shoot does this need to be to get this? We did, okay. we have, we have two days, so oh, we're going okay. to get it in this, in, in this amount of time. Cause okay. that's what we had. We had two days. Sure. So, okay. Um, and because I've done so many scrappy things and in a weird way, because I didn't start off like with that film school, like it's gotta be cinematic uh-huh. and perfect. And I need nine different shots. I yeah. was so easy about it that like, I knew what I was going to cut together. So anything extra was gravy. I just needed to get the stuff that I knew I had to have for the bare bones of the story. Right. And maybe a couple of the cool shots that I wanted, but then like, just, just get good performances. I mean, and you're golden, right? Like if, if somebody is giving a good performance, like 
that's all, that's all you, you look so good. Everybody thinks you're an amazing director when really you just have amazing actors. Do you remember what the first direction you gave was? <laughs> that's funny. I, uh, I mean, I know it was, a long, I, it was a while ago. I'm just curious if that's, if that's a, if that's a flashbulb memory for you. I don't remember that. I do remember learning the whole action. I kept forgetting to say action. Oh, okay. You know, because I was never, you know, like I was always on the other side of the camera. So I would always be like, okay, go. You know, yeah. um, I, it was a really interesting, the first time I said action and cut. Yeah. I, I remember that. Um, but I don't remember, I don't remember how easy it was. I don't know if I was really so brave with, with, um, directing the actors, they were so good. You know what I mean? Like I was, that's what I was wondering. Like you're you're thinking like they, they do it and you're like, Oh my God, that was amazing. Like what the heck am I supposed to say to them now? Actually, I'm pretty sure any direction I would have given was like faster. Yeah, exactly. The the George Lucas direction, faster and more intense, louder, faster, funnier. It's, I mean, (laughs) you know, you can make a meal out of it, but like that pace in comedy is you have to have a paced up option. It's just, I mean, those, at least the kind of comedy that I do. And that's the other thing I was going to say is I had a 15 page script, but this, but the movie came out to be 10 minutes. Oh, okay. And that's for the pretty extensive. Yeah. I know. I always, people are always like, you have to cut pages. This movie's too long. I'm like, no, I don't. Cause the way my dialogue is rapid fire, it takes room on a page, but it doesn't take that long. Yeah, that's a- Amy Sherman Palladino said the same thing, too. She's like, a Gilmore Girls script comes out at 60 pages, but I know that the way I'm going to shoot them, the the, the speed at which they're going to talk, it's going to come in at 45 minutes and it'll be fine. Yep. Yeah. So I have that same thing. I'm, I wonder, I would be curious about Aaron Sorkin, too, because he has yeah, a very... He, he does, too. I, I remember he was telling the story from uh, from Social Network that they turned the script in and they said, like, oh, no, it's it's 15 pages too long. And so he and David Fincher sat down with the recorder and did it the way they wanted to and then, like, timed it out and then, like, went back and said, look. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's it, if part of the rhythm is the thing and, and mm-hmm. it, it, yeah, you're right. That's one of those things that if you do snappy peppy dialogue then you you get yeah. a few more pages leeway um so yeah. obviously it's a small crew but like still yeah. everybody's coming to you with questions 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 yep like, oh and there are things that thank god other people thought of because they're talented right like right you know there's a scene in that movie this is called, it's called killing vivian and okay. um the scene in the, at the end of the movie where this woman has uh Spoiler alert, she's kidnapped <laughs> the dog and taken the dog in her car and she gets into a car accident. So the next time you oh. see her, I had not thought of this at all, but the thank God the makeup woman had mm. done special effects makeup and she was really good at it. So she added like a totally messed up face for Missy Pyle. And I had it that never occurred to me, right? Like what she right. would look like post car accident. I was trying to figure out how I could cheat an entire car accident by just tossing a hubcap in front of Paul Witten because obviously I can't shoot a car accident, you know? Right. Um, and there were some fun things that like, so so the makeup lady came up with that and then the wardrobe woman, Autumn Steed was like, she was incredible because, you know, she just had so many ideas and, and she's the one actually who talked to me about character and and why she was justifying the things that they were wearing and give, giving me choices and stuff. Like hmm. it was a n- whole new way of thinking about things. Cause again, I had done things that were like, I'm going to wear what's in my closet. I'll wear that right. weird shirt. I have, there yeah. was no connection to story or it was always like, I mean, I made a t-shirt that said, I love the gays. Like, I mean, <laughs> it, it, you know, like I'm, I made my props and things. And this was a, a moment where I didn't have to do any of that, you know? And, uh, So she's the one who taught me, like, you know, this is how you inform. This is how you inform. This is this is how I think this informs the story. Right. She wasn't, you know, teaching me in that way, but she was sort of telling me her process. And I was like, you're a genius. (laughs) And it was thank God that was my first experience because. Yeah, you know, it could have gone the other direction very, very easily. Oh, people could have been looking at me and be like, what do you think? And yeah. I would have had answers, but to really understand the process, watching their process, what they mm-hmm. knew, taught yeah. me, oh, okay, so in the future, that's how I get into the wardrobe 
woman's head or the wardrobe man's head of wardrobe's head, you know, that's how I talk to makeup. Like, and, and I'm still learning those things, but, um, it was just so great. And also, by the way, like I've, I've been on sets where you don't have really a hair and makeup department or anybody who's any more than like, this is my friend, Kathy, and she makes yeah. those brides, you know? <laughs> so it was really great to have that, have people who were so invested and so excited to, to do it, you know? So, uh, and there might not be a good answer to this question, but, uh, what's the worst direction you've ever been given and what's the worst direction you've ever given an actor? <laughs> what, uh, the worst direction I've ever been given probably again. <laughs> <laughs> Not slower, I mean, there's not just faster, no information. Not, just nope. again. Okay. Okay. Again. I'm like, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll give you some. I mean, the, you really don't know, like, should I do the exact same thing? You want me to give you something yeah. else? Do you want it? you know, so you just kind of, that's probably the worst direction I've ever, I, I like with voiceover, there's different things. I'm sure, but, you know, I mean, I, I, I oh, I'd have to think about it, but like, I'm sure at some point somebody was like, could you sound more like you're talking to a person or talking like sound more like it's just you talking <laughs> and like it's a little bit like hmm, that's funny i'm standing and i'm talking but are yes i will you know but and then the worst direction i've ever given i can tell you because i called the actress and i apologized to her now in retrospect it's i, I didn't even need to apologize it was fine but yeah. basically um you know, somebody's mother was my second movie and it was a comedy, but it was grounded in something very real, right? Like it was okay. like killing Vivian was, it was comedy, right? It was, it was sure. a dark comedy grounded in something real, but not really. Whereas somebody's mother is about a woman who, you know, her mother is like kind of moving on and becoming this giddy lovesick teenager and dating and mm. breaking all the rules. And then, she who has a child now has to be like the responsible grown up, and it's oh, killing her. You know, okay. she's like resentful of her mom, and you know she's she's having a kind of a stale marriage, and she's stressed about her kid, and she's sort of falling apart because she that's so that's what this movie is, but it's a funny movie, right? right. Um, so that fine line between like, well, this is a serious situation, but it's also very emotional. I mean, sorry, it's very, mm -hmm. it, but it's also funny. So it's emotional and funny. So anyway, Christine, <laughs> like it was a very vulnerable scene where she realizes, he says, you know, he's, he, the, her, she, her husband chases her out of the house and she says like, I don't even know about her mother. She says, I don't even know what she's thinking. I mean, she's the mother. Like what's, <laughs> what is she even thinking? And he just looks at her and she realizes she's like, oh, I'm the mother. <laughs> I, I'm the mother yeah. oh my god and she kind of like falls apart and Christine did this really beautiful she really got emotional and she was crying you know she was like sobbing into this into his shoulder and, <laughs> and it was fucking fantastic for the emotional beat of the scene but in a weird way because it was still supposed to be a comedy it was it was too much it was the performance had gone to the dramatic side uh -huh. and and I need, and, but I didn't, I didn't know it. I didn't know how to rein her in and, or how to, how to sh shape the performance the way that I wanted it. And so after she did this beautiful, raw, vulnerable thing, I went up to her and I was like, okay, great. Um, can you do like the comedy version of that? <laughs> and, and she looked, it was as if I had punched her in the face. Like she was like, What? the fuck is what does that even mean and she's like uh you know wiping tears and snot coming out of her nose she's like okay <laughs> and what happened was she ended up sort of not doing anything like she just sort of mm. didn't do anything and that actually was the take that worked right yeah hey so you got her there because there was well yeah by quite by accident and by <laughs> bottling my way because it made, I didn't say, Oh my God, that was wonderful. I, or maybe I did, but I, I did not make her feel comfortable. I was like, great. We have that. What about the funny version? Like I, it, I could see where that would be like shaming or she would feel weird. Cause she was in a vulnerable place, yeah. you know? Right. And I right. just, I, she, she had just shown you something. 
And I, yeah, yeah so that was awful. probably the crappiest direction that I'd ever given. But <laughs> like I said, it did work. I mean, there is, it is something that I do want to experiment with more and more because I see it time and again, man, an actor does nothing and it's the best performance because everybody projects everything right on top of them. Yeah. You know, everybody, everybody's watching the given circumstances of the scene. So if an actor's just kind of a blank slate, everybody's throwing their emotional everything on top of them and they don't need, you know, and it, you know, it was, uh, so that was a, that was a learning curve. And that was another movie that we had a table read. Mm. We just got together to read through the script. God bless Sharon Lawrence for coming and doing that because she's such a pro and she was doing me a favor and she did not have to do that. Like, a table read for a short film? Go fuck yourself. I mean, I really, <laughs> I, I cannot believe that she did that for me. Showed up at like seven o'clock on a Wednesday and agreed to do this. Like, wow. God bless that woman. She was so professional and so generous because she could have done that in her sleep, that role. And, but what I will say is at the table read, you know, we did this fun, funny version. And then, mm -hmm. and then the next we did it a couple more times and every time we did it, it progressively got darker and darker mm. and more dramatic. And suddenly the fights were not these fun comedic, like, you know, Meg Ryan and a rom-com fights. They were becoming like dark and loaded. And it yeah. was fascinating to me. It was something I really noticed. I was like, okay. So sometimes when you're doing comedy about real things, boy, it is, it is a, uh, right on the edge of the envelope where that tone yeah. goes, because you're saying pretty serious shit, but you're saying it in a funny way and how you get that tone is really tough, man. I was in, I was in a play in college, uh, and had that, that sort of experience too. The first night we did it, um, it was called the man who stayed by his negative. It was a really weird play about a guy who like, um, was mailing, pictures or something and he put yeah. it in the mailbox and he stood and so the only he was waiting by the mailbox tell the postman like through the night waiting for the postman to come because it was so important to him and there's all wow. these people he meets on the street so um the the first night we did it and the crowd was just roaring like i mean like the people were like just like oh this is hilarious uh, and the second night we did exact same everyone yep drama yeah everyone was just like quietly listening and stuff too i'm like Wow, I, I like I've never experienced that, where just the energy of the room changed, yeah. and suddenly the exact same material played comedic last night was now playing dramatic, and it was it was yeah I, now, I've never really had anything like that before. Was it meant to be a comedy? I don't know. I think okay. I think there. I, I think it was a dramedy because okay. it wasn't like like no, this is my post box. It's here. It's sort of like this about this guy who's really going through some emotional thing of like protecting this the, these pictures. Um, but then there's like you know a couple drunk guys come out of a bar like hey man how's it going you know and so they're like they're gonna pour beer in the in the mailbox and so the guy freaks out and has a big thing. So there's you know funny things in it but i know it's it's you know it's a lot of those uh those kind of plays are are sort of self-important already so it's kind of hard to tell where where the intention was but it's uh but it, it's interesting isn't it, it like is. how exactly because i've definitely had that i mean i just had that with a screening a screening of a rough cut of my film oh wow Oh, okay. God, yes. I mean, the first audience was like laughing at all the right places and they thought the lead character is completely lovable and it's hilarious. And boy, oh boy, that second audience, man, they did not feel that way. You could tell. <laughs> I mean, from yeah. the beginning, they... Yeah. There's a joke that there's a joke about how sad this woman is right in the beginning, like right in the first minute of the movie. Yeah. She's, you know, and and... It's supposed to be funny. Like you're supposed to be like, oh God, oh my God. Like that's hilarious. And yeah. boy, unless you think that's funny, <laughs> guess what? It's just sad. Like, you yeah. know, like if you're not, if you can't identify with it or whatever, like it's like, oh God. So um, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. So when you have someone like Sharon Lawrence, how do you get enough self-confidence to give them direction. Holy crap. I mean, like, well, it's what I like for one thing. It's, it's, it's weird already that, that you're the director with your friends or even your husband to like, like, Hey, can you do more like this kind of stuff? But when there's someone who has way more experience and that yeah. you're a fan of already, yeah. and then you need to adjust their performance. Like, 
mentally, how do you approach that before you even walk up to them? Well, okay. I, first of all, I was crapping my pants. I mean, (laughs) I was so nervous around her, but I tried not to be, I really, look, it was my movie. She had agreed to do it. Sure. And I was so grateful for that. And like I said, she was such a pro. She brought wardrobe options because we did not have a wardrobe person. Like she was a pro. She's also a huge advocate for women in film. So I think she does a lot of smaller films with female directors. She does small indie things. Like she really supports young, uh, you know, upcoming fresh voices. Like she's just that person. So I felt really honored that she would do that. And and to be honest, I actually didn't know that about her at the time. I just knew she Mm. was perfect. And Patrick knew her from something. I was like, well, you want me to reach out? And I was like, yes, please. And so there was that, that I, that she was, she came with this gracious, ready to play again, helping me with what I didn't know. Right. So that was great. Um, and then the other part of it was I was an actor. So yeah. I had been in acting class for years and I had yeah. done, I had been on sets as an actor for years. And so. You and, spoke you the know, language. Yeah. I knew I, I knew I know about three different ways that I as an actor get to things. Okay. And so I would, you know, at the very end of the day, the you know, at least you can do the given circumstances, right? And you and if that's not working, then you can give them something to do, right? You can give them some sort of filter like now let's say you you're a little hungover. Now mm-hmm. let's do it like, you know, you got to get out of this car because you have to pee now like do it like you just like right before like like this is the funniest thing you've ever heard it's tickling you right um you you know you can't wait to share it you can't wait to tell her off you can't or i i i one of my favorite tricks is doing opposites that is so successful right if it's an angry scene i want you to tell them if you're breaking up with someone i want you to tell them you love them with every line, but none of the lines say, I love you. Right. Um, things like that. Like I, you know, it's an angry scene. It says yelling, be calm or, you know, like uh, playing the opposite of something like it's hilarious, but try not to laugh. Right. It's, it's totally emotional and dramatic. Do everything you can not to cry. Do not let them see you cry, which is actually so powerful. (laughs) When you see somebody who's emotional and trying not to cry, like it it gets people there instantly because an actor sees, oh, she cries and they're like, oh God, you know, but being in the given circumstances of how awful and sad this is and saying, please don't cry. Try not to cry. Try not to cry. And then all of a sudden they're like, you didn't know that you were developing this bag of tricks over the years. Yeah, I now it turns out this is what it was for. Well, thank God I listened. I mean, I think <laughs> and in a weird way, like, thank God I wasn't a great actor. I, oh. I, 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 I mean, I was a great comedian. I, I know things about comedy. Like I know how to make a joke punchier and how to add a physicalization or how to go a little further with a character. Like and I know rhythm. I know yeah. it's gotta be faster, it's gotta be this, it's gotta the emphasis it's gotta be here. Like I know all that stuff really well, but in terms of navigating the emotional landscape or playing a scene with another partner and all that, like in a dramatic way, I did not know I was not good. I got completely self-conscious. So I went to class all the time to try to figure that out. And I tried all these things, Mm -hmm. you know, and the good news is that turned out to be a really great thing is that I had to learn it and relearn it and relearn it because it just didn't get into my head. So then when I turn to an actor and I see what they're doing, I go, okay, I have good ideas about what to do. Now, if I was doing television, it would be totally different. Like television, I was lucky enough to get invited to shadow on a few sets. Mm, Okay. And that's a totally, that's not totally different, but it's, there are some things that are very different about that. What am I, I guess the last question I had sort of about that, that first one is, yeah. how do you know when you're done for the, for that, like you're done, done? I, especially when people are working for very little money and they're working on the weekend. Right. Um, Cause you, I, you're, you're, you are always thinking pe- that about that. I'm a people pleaser. <laughs> I, I actually, no, I, 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 not every director does. There's oh, some people yeah, that are absolutely. like, I must get my shot. Yeah. I am not that way. I am. I believe it is my job 
to get the job done within the parameters of the production that we've all agreed on. It's my mm -hmm. job to get the job done well without making people suffer. It's okay. my job to get the job done while while preserving people's quality of life, their belief in themselves. Like, I mean, it, it's, I, I, I'm directing energy, right? And everybody's energy needs to be good or my project doesn't have a shot in hell of, of really thriving. I've seen some lovely directors. I mean, really, like when you have a professional crew, it's, you can get stuff done on time. My God, you know what I mean? Like I, I remember well, that again, when I was shadowing on a big movie and uh, not a movie, it was a TV show and the pace at which everybody was working. I was like, are you kidding? Like, this is a Cadillac DeVille. This is, are you joking? Like I take a pogo stick to the store and this is like a Maserati. This is amazing all the time they had and the crew would like jump. Everybody would say something, you know, anyway. But so to your point, so yeah. I, I really communicate with my first AD. Okay. And I like to know how much time we have planned to shoot mm -hmm. this scene. And I want to know when I have half an hour left, 20 minutes left, 10 minutes left. Like I want to know so that I can make adjustments as I go so I can get a feel for, you know, sometimes you can be perfecting this one shot. And if you've got four or five shots left to get that scene at that moment, you need to be aware of how much time you have left. So you can go, well, did I get enough? Cause remember we're editing this, like, right. you know, there's, there's, the, you can, it helps you. If you have a sense of time, you can start to go, no, I need to be picky about this. So therefore I'm going to change all that coverage. I was going to get on the end part, which isn't as important. And I'm going to get that in a one from over here. Like, so you can sort of make those adjustments as you go. And you don't know whether you're doing it right. Like that, that way of working, it's always worked really well on my shorts and I, it did end up working on my feature, but I didn't know if it would work yeah. <laughs> because it's so like crap. I mean, I did a lot of stuff in my head. There's, there's always stuff that happens that's not planned. So you plan as well as you can for this is the coverage and this is how we're going to do it. And this is about how much time it should take. But, you know, if somebody throws you a wrench, if a light keeps shutting off or if, right. you know, there's a big sound thing or if, you know, I mean, whatever, whatever it is, there's a wrong wardrobe. So they got to go back and get the next, or the actor's not ready yet. Like whatever the thing is, you have, you always, always have to pivot. And, but I still feel like even if that happens, I'm not going to make my crew suffer for that. It's my job to know enough about how to do this, to figure it out, how to do it. Now that said, mm -hmm. there was a couple there. Were, I've the first time I ever went over a 12 hour day was on my movie and I was like, damn it. But but it was only like 20 minutes. And I, oh. I, I talked to the crew and I was like, here's the deal. <laughs> if we take 20 minutes, we can go get the shot. And I really need it. I need it today. I need it at this time of night. And this is really the time we can get it. So um, we don't have to get it because I am a firm believer. You've worked your tails off and, you know, we can go. And they were like, no, because apparently other people work them 14, 16 hour days. So they were <laughs> like, are you kidding? 12 hours and 20 minutes? It's nothing. So I was lucky with that. But I really try to stay very strict to that because I, I would prefer 10 hour days, to be honest. But. But yeah, but th but there's a lot to do. So. All right. So you finish all this stuff now. You have all the footage, like you basically everybody's gone home. It's just it's just you alone with your footage. Yep. And then, do they put you with an editor, or do you do you pick an editor? I mean, I, I know that the for the first short film we're talking about the did they they already had somebody that was on staff. Yep, they had a okay. guy who was so great. And oh, okay, that was gonna say so because that that ends up becoming a very short term but intimate relationship. He was great he was just as good as they recommended. Like he did such a great first pass and we sat and did, I don't remember how many weeks it took or how we did it or how, I mean, how long it took. Um, but he did a really nice rough cut. And then I came in and, you know, yeah. louder, faster, funnier. Cause the other thing about the editor is, and this happened on my feature as well. They have to show you your movie. Like they have to show you every line, every oh, joke, interesting. every bit. Now, uh, sometimes an editor can take liberty and go, you know, the shot, like this big, long, drifty shot over the house, whatever. It just yeah. didn't work. It took away. So I didn't put it in there. 
But most of the time, for at least for the first rough pass, they will put everything in there that you said. And, mm-hmm. and that you have a script supervisor on set as well. So let me go back for a second. When you're on set and you're trying to make decisions about how to make your day, you have the first AD telling you the schedule, telling you if you don't get something here, you could get it here, or you have 10 minutes, we got to there's no other time you can do this. Mm -hmm. And then you also have your script supervisor who's taking notes the whole time about like, when you go, I like that take, that's the one or, and so they're right. And they're also writing down like for the editor, you know, this one got cut off at this line because there was a plane or she dropped her drink or, you know, like, so they keep track of where all the pieces of the footage are to help the editor have some sanity. And they also, (laughs) the script supervisor also, when you're at the end of a scene and they're like, you've got five minutes, do you want anything else? Or that's it, we should move on. You can look to your script supervisor and you can go, is there anything I missed? Yeah. And she'll say, there's that one line, you never got this line on camera. You got it in the master, but you never got it in his coverage. Do you want that line? You know, or she'll go, yep, you covered everything a bunch. Or, But she'll... She'll go, did you want to try this? You know, you, you in the master, she never ha- hung up the hat on the coat rack. Do you care about that? Stuff like that. Then when you go to edit, mm-hmm. you have all the notes, but that person's not there, right? No, right. They're not there. Okay. They so you just have to notes. go by, yeah. by all the, the how, how good of a note taker they were. Some editors look at those notes and some don't. <laughs> okay. I mean, some editors are like, I'm going to choose what I think is the best take because, you know, and that's where we're going to stop the conversation for today. If you'd like to hear more of Mandy's voice, she's got her very own podcast. It's called The Mand Cave, hosted in collaboration with her friend Mandy Kaplan. You'll find it wherever the finest podcasts are found. Thanks so much for listening. This has been the next chapter in the Curiosity Codex, but there are still many pages left to decipher. We're part of the True Story FM family of podcasts. Find out more about us at truestory.fm. Our theme music is Intrusion by Severed Personality, a.k.a. Kevin McLeod. The voice of the Codex is Vicki Hall. Find her on the web at vickihall.squarespace.com. And my name is Kyle Olson. The Codex is closed for now.